You are listening to the David Cassidy Connections with your host, Louise Poynton. Well, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the David Cassidy Connections, your podcast all about David's legacy. Thank you for downloading this podcast wherever you're listening on your preferred streaming platform. And remember to click the subscribe button so you will be the first to know when new episodes are released. I am your host, Louise Poynton, and today I am so excited to speak with one of my heroes. I am very, very pleased to welcome my guest, who tells everyone he was inspired to play the guitar by Keith. Oh, Richards, they exclaim. No, he tells them seriously, Keith Partridge. He has played with some of the legends of rock, Slash, Brian May, Gilby Clark, Robin Zander, It is an A to Z of the best guitarists on the planet, and he just happens to be one of them as long-time lead guitarist with one of the most exciting rock bands in history, the Alice Cooper Band. He is currently touring with the band, having joined them in 1996, and for 10 years was Alice's right-hand man. In 2012, he rejoined and, between touring and recording, hosts his own podcast, In the Trenches. Check out all his links in the accompanying show notes. We recorded this interview in early March, before the tour resumed, to talk about glam rock, fame and David's powerful influence on his own career. He has released his own versions of California Man by the Move and Slade's Merry Christmas Everybody, and In his own words, the man who spent two years recording with Slash's Snake Pit, Ain't Life Grand, admits, in reality, I always wanted to be Keith Partridge. Here is my conversation with Ryan Roxy. What a pleasure it is to welcome to my show, Ryan Roxy. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I am enjoying this so far. I mean, right out of the gate, we have a very common ground with glam rock, um, pop rock, if you will, and I w- went so bold to say the uh, the the dirty word bubblegum pop, which I'm definitely one of my guilty pleasures. It is, and why not? Yeah, I must <laughs> just just mention Nita Strauss, who's one of your fellow band members. Of course, she played, she played the national anthem in Rock and Roll Star at last Sunday's NASCAR race. At the auto- Are you a NASCAR fan as well? I am. There you go. Yeah, All right. She- Bubble gum and NASCAR. Yeah, she's she's really good at doing uh, those opening ceremonies now. She's been uh, she's been doing it for a few years now the on the circuit. But I think this might have been one of her first NASCAR events. And um, but she got a lot of practice last year um, being the guitarist for the L.A. Rams, who just won the Super Bowl. So we were all happy for her. Um, because hopefully she gets a Super Bowl ring out of it. Um, but we're all big football fans in the Alice Cooper group, and we're also very supportive of one another in the projects that we do. So good for her and good for good for NASCAR and good for uh, all of us. There's so many things we're going to talk about, including David Cassidy's influence on your career, um, but what's it like to be back touring? And are you proud to be part of Alice's legacy? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things every single night we know um, that we're sort of contributing a little bit to a, a rock and roll history, iconic legacy of an artist that's been around for so many decades. And every show that we do, and we do our best to um, give the best show off as possible, Give the, put the best show on. Um, Alice is our lead, so we just look up to him and we follow his lead and he supports us when we go up and have our moments to shine. And the cool thing about it is every single night we play, there's still, you know, a handful of people that have never seen Alice Cooper before. So we're their basic first you know, dive because they've heard about it. And oh, you've got to see, you know, either from a friend or a family member, you got to see Alice Cooper. You got to come and check it out. So for us, it's kind of cool to be ambassadors to uh, the whole world of Alice Cooper. And that's what they see. And uh, at this point, it's crazy, but I've 
actually witnessed four generations at a show. It used to be three generations. That was crazy. But now we've actually had a small kid and then his great grandfather coming to the show. So that was kind of a great four generational. Uh, it just kind of shows you the power of rock and roll and how long we've been around and how long uh, hopefully rock and roll will be around. Now, I know you've played with guitarists like Slash and yes. with your fellow players in the Alice Cooper band. Do you learn from each other and indeed from everyone that you play with? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. It's one of the things that I say in the guitar clinics and appearances that I do when I talk about um, learning how to play guitar and, if, and that you can draw something from anybody that you sit down with and play music with. It is a language. It's like talking. And you can really learn something from someone that might not be as advanced as you or be completely way above your pay grade and way above out of your league as far as playing wise. There's something to learn from both ends and someone that you're on par with because the way that they play guitar, the way that they play their instrument, that is their voice. So I'm always up for conversations with people as I'm up for conversations musically with musicians. And again, there's something to learn from every person you play with. So, you know, whenever you're sitting down at a jam session and maybe you think, oh man, well, these guys aren't as experienced as I am. They're going to teach you something. And then when you go to a jam session where perhaps musicians have way more experience than you, you have that right to sit at the table because you're going to show them something. You should know that. Now, your heroes growing up included Peter Frampton. And I think Absolutely. I'm right in saying that you dyed your hair purple because you <laughs> that was his hair color. At one point, I dyed my hair almost every color that um, that's in the book at this point. And they call, every color that Manic Panic put out, I think there's a, a hair coloring from, from New York City, and we love them. Um, but I had fire engine red at one point. I had purple. I had... Uh, Billy Idol White, um, one tour, Chuck and I both got mohawks in New York. So we had blonde mohawks at, at, you know, at one point in the tour. And then I actually had blonde dreadlocks. I had braids, orange braids, because when you're going from dark hair to blonde hair, there is that medium orange that uh, lasts for a while. And so basically every single hairstyle and hair color I even had a perm growing up because, you know, it was the seventies and, you know, talking about T-Rex, maybe there was a little bit of homage or, you know, looking up to, um, T to T-Rex with his curly hair, as well as Peter Frampton For, on the album Frampton comes alive. It seems that, uh, not only is his hair purple, it's kind of nice and cool, stringy, curly vibey, which is the exact opposite of hair that I had. I had, really thick yeah i have hispanic blood in me half of me does so it's like this thick bush of hair and couldn't kind of maybe a little bit of a wave but not wavy enough to be curly and too wavy to ever be really straight and thin so you know i i've been sort of it took me years to accept like where am i with my hair mm -hmm. until then motley crew came out and they they taught us all about Aquanet and uh, <laughs> and uh, teasing your hair and flat ironing your hair. So between Motley Crue and Hanoi Rocks, I think those two bands taught me just as much about music as they did about, you know, hairstyling. I'd like to just start talking about Alice, who once described you as a Jimmy Page type player. Can you tell me the story about when you auditioned for, for Alice? And something, sure. something that you did that probably secured the deal for you. I think what I did, the best thing I could do was inherently be myself at the audition. Um, I did learn all the flashy parts that you're supposed to learn in going into the audition because Alice, you know, a lot of in his eras of music, especially the eighties eras, there's a lot of shredding involved. I had learned those parts, but what I was listening to at the audition is what made me change a little bit and say, Roxy, just go in there and be yourself because 
I could hear that song Poison where people were stumbling over that pre-chorus. It's a really beautifully written pre-chorus. Desmond Child and Alice Cooper um, co-wrote that song together. And it's a lot of chord changes in that pre-chorus. So everyone that I was listening to in the room next door, because we were in the sort of the holding room, the coffee room, and I was listening to the other players and they were messing up that pre-chorus, but they were nailing the solo. So I was like, well, someone's already got the gig because they've nailed that shredding solo. What if I just go in there and just nail those chords? And I'm the only one that maybe does it perfect and doesn't even think about doing the solo, just play those rhythm chords. And that's basically what I did. As well as go in with the other songs that were more original Alice Cooper songs at the audition, 18 and Billion Dollar Babies, which are classics. But those solos aren't as shredding as poison. So for instance, 18 is very pentatonic based and maybe that's where Alice um, gives me that great compliment of uh, any sort of page endorsement. That's great because we both are based out of the blues rock and so many guitar players, almost every rock guitar player, every, every one of my guitar heroes bases their, uh, most of their solos out of the pentatonic blues. Um, so 18 is very E minor -y, pentatonic blues like you know esque and that's exactly what i did for those uh for those solos and hopefully well not hopefully um it it definitely worked the the, the trick worked and and the sort of audible call that i made that day um led to basically a promise of one year which now has turned into what I can't do the math, but we're, we're, we're nearing on 30 years. So that's pretty cool. So your other guitar heroes were the likes of Brian May, Keith Richards, uh, Rick Nielsen. Yep. Um, Those are all great ones, as well as some, some unsung heroes that I have in there. Johnny Thunders, very rock and roll, blues-based um, guy, um, but with a pop edge, a pop feel to it. Um, Andy McCoy, great songwriter, great player from the band Hanoi Rocks. Uh, Pat Benatar's guitar player, Neil Giraldo, Pat Benatar's husband as well, but his, you know, her guitar player is Neil Giraldo. Love his parts. Um, Elliot Easton from the band called The Cars. Great albums and great solos. Every single one of them tells a story. And um, of course, Steve Stevens from the Billy Idol band. Big fan of his. And uh, again, I think we both obviously looked at those same album covers uh, growing up because um, even though he's a couple years my senior, but not much, I'm close behind him. Uh, we both have that big, big Aquanet hair back in the 80s. And he he still does. I, I wear hats now, but he, he's got, he still has got it. <laughs> and then there was two years spent with Slash recording Ain't Laugh Grand in his Snake Spit. And in other, I can't even say it this afternoon. Snake Pit Studios. Snake Pit. Yeah. What an say that five times and you'll see Slash's yeah. ghost. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, that was an experience. It was, it was definitely about as rock and roll circus and rock and roll carnival as you can get. It was a circus every single day going to his place because that's where we would rehearse. And he had snakes he had piranhas in the in his um aquarium um he had a big dinosaur not an actual dinosaur but a dinosaur fountain we had a full i mean i'm talking about all the sort of uh temptations that were there a full uh half court full pool olympic size pool uh back basketball court uh jägermeister on tap Guinness on tap, but then a full functioning 24 track recording studio, which we would record and write every single day for, for years. You know, we made that album a, three different times, I would say. So um, I think it finally came out right. I think uh, our last version with Jack Douglas producing it, who has such a rich history in producing rock and roll, all the great, Aerosmith records even produced some great Alice Cooper records uh, with Muscle of Love and of course worked with the great John Lennon so um, Jack Douglas produced that record and I think there's a ton of a ton of music on there that it takes more than just one sitting 
to like really appreciate it. So, you know, hopefully, and, and a lot of people don't know about that record. A lot of people, it came at a weird transition in rock when before classic rock had really taken off and, and gotten its foothold in audiences and it was still tapering out of grunge, but then there was rap rock happening and, and we were still just basic straight ahead, hard rock. And I feel that that album, um, a little bit overlooked, but you know what? The people that did see that album and have listened to that album um, really got something out of it. And which is cool because it's something for people to discover even to this day. Yeah, absolutely. I urge anyone who hasn't to listen to it. They will be educated on many levels. So nice. in between all this hard rock, tell me where David Cassidy slots in. Because you once said that you didn't think he had any idea of the amount of inspiration he gave to people like you. Can you elaborate on that? I grew up in the Bay Area, just outside of San Francisco. So the music that I was exposed to was such a great spectrum of music. I was exposed AM radio, um, rock station called KFRC out of the Bay Area. Every morning I wake up to it, Dr. Don Rose would uh, wake us up in the morning and he's the morning DJ. Well, on those shows, they would play the Commodores next to Aerosmith, next to the Bee Gees, next to Cheap Trick, next to... So, so it was always this cool spectrum of, of music, rock, funk. And in all of that, I was listening also and watching intently Friday nights, The Partridge Family. And that television show, more than all the music I was listening to, that sort of visual that I was being able to see every single week and run to the TV and, and watch my hour of, I think it was Brady Bunch first and then Partridge Family, or it might have been switched around one or the other. But th they, those two followed each other for, for a few years. And it just seemed like David Cassidy's life was one that I wanted to emulate. One that I wanted to, at least on TV, you know, Keith Partridge, not, maybe not David Cassidy, but Keith Partridge was, seemed like he had the idyllic life, you know, he was always playing gigs, girls loved him, you know, seemed to get along with his family, all the things that kind of like wasn't happening for me at that time. Like my parents were getting divorced and, uh, you know, uh, I was not the most popular kid in school. I played guitar, so it was it was fine, but I was, you know, you're a kid. So, you, you know, you're going through your your phases of being, a, of being a kid and you think you don't fit in. Sometimes you think you're the outsider. So it just seemed like he, being a musician, had it figured out. So that was a huge influence for me, you know? And then when I would get the records, I really liked it. His voice was great. So, so that made me want to sing, even though I didn't have a lot of confidence in my voice for many, many years. You know, I'm still paranoid, if you would say, about my, about, you know, holding on to my voice when I go, when I do my solo uh, tours. I'm always like, oh, shit, is there there's seven shows in a row? Am I going to be able to sing after the seventh show? I get, I get inside my own head. I've, I've realized how not to do it. Um, you know, in the past few years, and I've realized to become really comfortable with my voice. But at the same time, yeah, it's just seemed like David Casty and Keith Partridge, they had it, you know, voice always sounded great on record. Every TV show, I know it's TV now, but then it just seemed like, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. Yes. So that's what I eventually set out to do. And in, in some ways, I've been able to live that rock and roll dream in so many ways. I have, you know, most of it thanks to Alice because he's opened so many doors um, for me as far as new experiences. Every single tour, we get some sort of new cool experience that I uh, have like a bucket list sort of thing. And um, myself, I, I've, I have been able to achieve a lot of the goals that I set out for myself. So I'm still not done, though. I still got a lot to go. You said when you when you met David in the 1990s. Yes, I um, did. That you had shaken the hand of the man who had passed the torch of rock and roll onto me. That's a that's a pretty good quote. I didn't remember saying that, but that was exactly <laughs> what I, it it wasn't 
probably as monumental as that sounds passing the torch but it was a handshake it was a a smile it was eye contact it was at a club um our roommate's uh wife at the time um we were all kind of living communally in in, in west hollywood because what you do financially everybody kind of lives together uh we were all living together and she was playing keyboards in his band and uh, she said hey you want to we're doing this it might have been a corporate type of gig right. i believe it was right on la siena again los angeles at, at sort of a restaurant type office setting and you know, it's it was it, he had a, he had a cool setup. Those corporate things are always great because you know someone's getting paid a big old check, and it was him that day. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, but 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 he took the time to say hello to me, and and um, maybe he didn't know how big of a um, influence he had on me because we didn't really have that much time to explain it all. But you know what? Hey, I was happy to uh, to shake the hand. It was at that time that he was relaunching what could and should have been a successful rock career revival. Do you think that maybe he was a little bit ahead of his time? Perhaps, you know, sometimes you can get just a little bit ahead of the times and it works for you because in retrospect, everyone goes, wow, I was kind of smart that he was doing that back then. Or sometimes it can be like, shit, should have been second should have should have been the next guy to do it because it was a great idea but it's it starts and it got popular after the second wave so to speak i mean i remember with alice cooper we started playing casinos really really early in my touring career just to you know something to fill up uh because i used to tell people you know it's monday through thursday everywhere in the world so of course your your Friday Saturday sh you know shows are always going to be money makers because you have it's a weekend gig and people are off but you got to fill that Monday Tuesday Wednesday slot you know mm. so we were early on doing uh, casinos when a lot of bands weren't doing they were going nah I don't know about that but then the funny thing is it seems to me Alice was a little bit took some time with doing meet and greets where a band like kiss was early on the meet and greets and people were like, well, I don't know. That's uh, it's kind of, I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but guess what? Every band does it now. Just like casinos, every band plays casinos as well. I wondered if the opinion within the hard rock fraternity was that maybe David was considered an aging 1970s teen idol, a tag that he hated and perhaps there wasn't a place for him at that time it's too bad because I, I would have obviously never thought about that because to me, you know, David was rock and roll. He was always rock and roll. Um, yeah, he was good looking rock and roll singer, but there was a lot of great looking rock and roll singers, uh, from the seventies. So, um, the tag teen idol, I, I can see where, where he might not like it, but in some ways, maybe could have leaned into it a little bit more and then and then show yourself with a live band that you do rock and that you that you do belong and have a seat at the table you know it's uh, it's hard to to say but you know i know that if i was playing in david's band back in those days i would have done my best to make it a rock show he had the appearance of being beautiful and got criticized for the way he looked. But in the 1980s and beyond, when all that was the big thing in the rock scene, you've had people like Sebastian Bach, of course. Axel Rose, girls going crazy for rock stars who were beautiful to look at, but they were successful enough, but still the music had to sell. Yeah, maybe part of the it was the double-edged sword was that the thing that got you so popular is the thing that caused this sort of question mark amongst whatever people that say they're credible um you know critics or whatever is yeah. the tv show you know because he wasn't david cassidy on the tv show he was a role keith partridge well yeah but his personality his songs his demeanor he, he was just the only thing different was the name he was being himself on camera i can imagine so you know 
it's a blessing and a curse because it was able to get the albums out there, get the music out there and establish him for, for, um, as a musician and as, as a, as a great musician. But at the same time, there will always be that, you know, TV show at that time, again, maybe too early because now if someone came out with a TV show that every, every per every artist, it seems that comes out of the Disney family and the Disney channel network, they seem to have a recording career afterwards, you know, they seem to, or, or has a TV show mm. afterwards. You see, you go back to Frampton. He managed to get rid of that teen image that he had, certainly in, in the UK when he was in the herd. And then you've got Rick Nelson, who was able to get accepted more as a rock star. Sometimes television can misrepresent you. Or a pair of white pants on an album called I'm In You. Because that actually put him right back into that <laughs> for Peter. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can, he, he, he climbed all the way out of that hole and then he made that album with white pants on. It's funny, uh, you know, it, it's it's funny how people remember those things. But I remember reading articles that, that, you know, it wasn't about the album. It was about the album cover. And I was like, yeah. are you serious? He just made probably the most, with talking in regards to Peter Frampton, he just made one of the most influential live albums of all time. I don't think anything will ever touch that as, as far as live albums. I mean, obviously there's going to be people that, that, that push back and they say, well, wait a second, Kiss Alive or Cheap Trick at Budokan, of course, great albums. But Frampton Comes Alive, the first time when I heard it, you know, there was so many eye openers, like, what is this? A double album? What? And there's like rock songs and acoustic songs. And it seems like all these people in San Francisco love him. You know, it was years later that I realized that some of that crowd noise was like manufactured and stuff, but it doesn't matter. I was, I mean, look, it's still a crowd that he played in front of and they recorded it. Maybe some magic with the faders and stuff like that. But as a kid, you know, that album was just as influential as, as the Partridge family. And of course, you know, later on for me, uh, the Cheap Trick records that uh, have sort of provided me with the soundtrack of my life. Sometimes you just have to be so good at whatever you do that no one can criticize you. But there's always gonna be someone there to criticize. Well, I mean, it, it just, I mean, you're not doing it right unless there's a handful of people. The, the, the focus for me these days and for the longest time has been not to, not to single out the one guy that, or girl that doesn't like you, but focus on the 999 that, that do appreciate what you do as musicians we're to this day, we're still, even as much as people say, ah, it doesn't matter. It's water off my, you know, it slides off me, whether it's a live situation or a, uh, something to do with with a review of some sort, you're going to, or comments for one, you're going to, for whatever reason, focus on that, that one person that's not satisfied, but you know what? I've done a good job these last couple of years of just like, not that it would, wouldn't affect me if I read it, but I just won't read it. When I see it, when I see it going in that direction, unless it has merit, some criticism has merit. And when it hits you in the right place, and if, they, if they're spot on, you can go, hey, I can learn from this. But again, that 999 out of one, uh, usually the criticism comes from that person's, you know, sometimes you just don't like you and that's okay. Everyone's got their own opinions. I mean, you and I obviously both love bubblegum. Yes, we do. Hugely influenced by the British bands in the 1970s with glam rock. Yes, and I was. The Sweet, bands like The Sweet, uh, T-Rex, um, Bowie, um, Slade, uh, who else? Mott the Hoople. Um, a lot of, so many bands were, it, it was the UK that was sort of leading the charge with, with that uh, style of music. The first album I ever made and ever recorded, I was lucky enough to record in London at the Good Earth Studios and... Tony Visconti produced our album, who produced every single T-Rex album that we all love and know. And 
the cool thing about it is we were getting to use a lot of the same recording tricks because obviously Tony Visconti being the master producer that he is, he has his bag of producer's tricks that he uses when he records bands. And a lot of them that he used were the same ones that he was able to use with the T-Rex albums as well. So that was kind of a thrill. That's wicked. <laughs> oh. But then came some, you know, even more type of almost, I wouldn't say corporate bubble gum, but I love it all the same in, in some ways, the musicianship, the really poppy songs, like I was telling you before uh, we started the podcast, I was listening to you know, Tony DeFranco and the DeFranco family, you know, who was, who was basically a perfect uh, kind of a, in the middle of the road between um, I would say the Osmond brothers and the Jackson five. So here's the DeFranco family, and it's like they're from Canada. And I didn't know, I always thought that, you know, Italians, the DeFranco family, they're from New York, of course, you know, growing up as a kid. No, they're from Canada. So, and, and of course, the Partridge family, you have to, you have to sort of lump them in there as well as part of those bands that had this really polished sound. And I know that, um, a, a lot of the bands, the musicians that played on those albums, you know, they were, um, what's the group, Larry Carlton and part of the, the, not the goon squad, not the hit squad, but the, there's a group of musicians in Los Angeles during that time that was playing on session yeah. musicians that were playing on so crew. many of those, the wrecking crew. That's what it was. Yeah. And, um, you got to appreciate those musicians because they made, records that basically influenced me, inspired me to go all the way with music and go all in on music. When you won your first guitar award, you played Puppy Love, didn't you? Puppy Love. That's right. I mean, I, I was way too young to, to, you know, sing it, but I played it on acoustic guitar. I was like, you know, I think it was, I think I was about maybe, maybe eight years old, maybe yeah. even younger. Yeah. Puppy Love. I remember oh it. I mean, I even had the Jimmy Osmond solo album, oh, no, yeah. Rubber Ball, Bouncing Back to You. I know that. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the thing is about the Osmond brothers, if you listen to Crazy Horses, which is like an amazing hard rock album, mm -hmm. people don't give it the credit that it deserves. But there's one of the Osmond brothers, I forget who it is, but it sounds exactly like Axl Rose. It must have yes. been Meryl, okay? Yes. Yeah, I had like a screechy type of Axl Rose type of voice. And I was like, man, that's that's amazing. As well as, you know, the, the, the backgrounds, not the Osmond Brothers so much, but there was a band that I, I grew up in the same Bay Area as a band called Jellyfish. And Jellyfish, their backgrounds, very much like the Partridge family, very much like David Cassidy and, and those types of albums. So quite cool. I mean, his voice, I mean, David's voice, Axl Rose, unique voices. That's true. That is true. You mentioned The Sweet just now being one of your favorite bands. When you get artists like David Cassidy and Brian Connolly, who both hated the bubblegum market, which they were pushed into, they're basically banned from, from being themselves. How damaging can that be because The Sweet emerged as a serious rock band once all the bubblegum um, fanzine material had, had, had gone by? You know, their B-sides always had their own compositions on. That's true. But then again, you know, that's the whole thing. What had established them, what had allowed them to, to get their original stuff out to the mainstream audience was those covers that that broke open the gates at first so you can't i mean i never disparage i try not to disparage never say never try not try my best not to disparage the the breaks that i've gotten and where i've i've come from mm -hmm. um i've been very lucky enough in my own career to play to play with like credible names guys like alice cooper um guys like slash and in that, and then the pop sort of world, making that Tal Bachman record that I did with that, with that song, She's So High, that was, you know, is, you know, he comes from rock and roll pedigree with Randy Bachman as his dad and Bachman Turner Overdrive. So there's a lot of credibility there. Now, if, for instance, if, if I would have 
broken uh, my music career through something that maybe didn't have as much credibility, I'd still have to pay homage to the breaks that it gave me. Like the band that I came out of and we all came out of, and again, it does have a bit of credibility, but it's a definite bubblegum metal band, if you will, was the band called Candy. And that's where I came from. That's where Gilby Clark came from. Uh, John Schubert, Jonathan Daniel. We, I mean, we were all together as Candy. When they first began, when Candy first began, they were a definite bubblegum band. Bands like the Raspberries, bands like the Archies even at one point, and Partridge Family thrown in there for good measure were all influences. But they were playing in front of bands like wasp and rat and you know he just heavier bands that's exactly the way that candy was for me in los angeles i joined i joined more almost like this episode of the brady bunch the johnny bravo episode and i think it's peter brady gets the gig because he fits the suit it's the johnny bravo episode i know it because again it came on right before partridge family so I got the gig for Candy because I kind of fit the suit. I had black hair, you know, a lot of hairspray. But we were playing and doing shows with much heavier bands. We were playing shows with Jane's Addiction, Guns N' Roses, Faster Pussycat. So these were all a bit heavier, but we came from that pop area. But I always wanted to make my guitars loud and thrashy, and I kept doing that. And what became Candy became um, Electric Angels. And what became Electric Angels, we came back to jamming with Gilby Clark uh, and doing his solo album. And what came from jamming with Gilby Clark and the solo album was obviously getting to hang out with the Guns N' Roses guys, eventually meeting Slash, also the break with Alice Cooper. So all those things came from this very power pop uh type of band it's funny if you say power pop it doesn't sound as uh it doesn't sound as campy as bubblegum but it's the same sort of thing and i and i love i love power pop bands and you know i love bubblegum as you know alice once said he did not know of a single human being for whom fame has brought them anything but suffering and pain can you tell me about your relationship with fame <laughs> Did you always want to be famous? I definitely wanted to make a living, see the world, and doing it playing music. So I've definitely gotten the upper end of the stick on that one. Um, the massive fame that Alice has that he's talking of, and he deals with it really well. It's a hard road, I would think, when it gets to be that um, claustrophobic when people are so in your face and what they want, they want a piece of you one way or another that I've, I've never had that on a constant basis. And, you know, I should be thankful for that. Right. Because I, I get a, a good measurement of fame. I tell my wife that I, I'm famous for, you know, 90 minutes on stage and about 20 minutes afterwards. Then everything kind of just dies down and I can just be a normal Joe and go into a Starbucks and order and, and you know, get my name spelled wrong on a cup just like everybody else. But the thing is, Alice can't because wherever he goes, he's so recognizable. Guys I've played with, Slash, he can't. Everybody recognizes him. And it's not like, hey, how you doing? Love your music and move on. It's hey, let me tell you a story about how your music has changed my life. Do you have a half an hour to sit down? Or wait a second, let's just take a picture first. Wait a second, let me get, let me call my friends because they, they're not going to believe that you're here. And then it becomes a thing. And so I can see where that can be. Um, it can be hard, but it's obviously part of the deal that you choose. You know, it's, 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 it's the... It's not a consequence. It's just what goes along with fame. If if you are lucky enough to um, get to that level where basically financially you're set, 
See, for me, it's like, yeah, I, I'm, I need to do this next tour. Yes, I'm going to need to tour for a few more years, yeah. and I'm happy to do that. And I love being in the trenches. I love being on tour because that's all I, I'll, I pretty much have known for so many, many years. I'm good with that. And if I can retire and, and, and walk away from this game and have a nice life, hey, I'm happy about it. But um, it's not like... I'm someone that doesn't even ever have to think about working again. Whereas some of the people that I played with, they're at that point and it's cool, but then that leaves other challenges for them. Like what do they have to do that challenges them? That's so I admire Alice for, you know, every year continuing to tour every single um, few years, make an album and every single, you know, other year, do something that he hasn't done in his career, whether it's commercials or the radio show. You know, I look at all those things that he does as sort of a benchmark, like, huh, good idea. Maybe I should do it. He's had his, his TV sh or his um, radio show now, what, for almost 15 years, something like that going on that. Well, you know what? I have had my podcast now for a good two years. So, and it's, and it's rolling along, it's rolling along and I and enjoy that, but it's like, Hey, just always challenge yourself and uh, keep setting goals for yourself. I think that's the best way to, uh, to beat any sort of fame ghouls. If there, if there are, is there is such a thing? Yeah. Now your mother was a drummer in the school marching band and your father played the trumpet in a military band. So I assume it was only going to be right that you would end up in a band of some description. Um, <laughs> Your guitar teacher once told your mother, and you overheard a conversation where he said, oh, he will never make a guitar player. Mm, that that's true. That did happen. Yeah, a German guy. And I was taking group lessons. It wasn't one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons, too. So he said it loud enough, I think, so that not just my mom, but a few people in the class uh, could hear it, too. And I was supposed to be walking out the door, but I definitely heard it. And in many ways sometimes a negative i can you can turn it into a positive almost like a rally cry like i'm going to show this guy but um i do i do find it funny because he did say that made me work harder and then luckily you know not through that comment but through a lot of other uh lucky breaks and hard work i was able to establish myself and uh, get to where i'm at today my first guitar teacher though steve phillips see i don't remember i just know angry german guitar teacher <laughs> told me i couldn't play but my first guitar teacher steve phillips private lessons he's the one that taught me you know partridge family songs he's the one that taught me peter frampton songs i still remember him teaching me plain shame do you feel like we do so you know and i still know his name and he was in a band himself so Steve Phillips, wherever you are, uh, know that you have just as much influence as David Cassidy. The influence of David Cassidy and that music, it was dismissed at the time as bubblegum and because he was promoted as this perfect all-American boy. But the music itself had so much more substance. Do you listen to it now and continually hear different things <laughs> about it? I was listening to it yesterday. You know, it came after I had my, um, I'm t I can tell you right now, look at this. I have my um, YouTube uh, thing on. <laughs> I was listening to that album yesterday that. and uh, Sound it was uh, Love Is All That I Ever Needed. What is it? Love Is All That I Ever, yeah. such, such great musician. You know, the, yeah, that, that was the part, that was the Sound Magazine album. But um, it had I Woke Up In Love This Morning. I, it, it just happened to be on this playlist when I was walking around um, town yesterday. And one of the exercises I'm doing right now is uh, treating myself to sort of a, a little guilty pleasure of my own. What is it? Well, walk around with headphones on, walk around the city that you love and uh, listen to some, listen to a whole album. Mm -hmm. So I was able to listen to the whole album yesterday. So that was kind of cool. So you've done covers of The Moves' California Man, a real yes, rocking version of Merry Christmas, Everybody, Slade's mm -hmm. anthem. Have you ever thought about doing a Partridge Family cover? Well, oddly enough, my roommate 
my first roommate they, that I ever had in Los Angeles, Johnny Holiday, plays in a band called Star Star. And um, oh, they've had to change their name now. What is it? Um, Star Star has become, if you look at for Johnny Holiday, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see him. They, his band has done a cover of I Woke Up in Love This Morning, a great cover of it. So um, I feel that at some point I would love to do it. I, in, in fact, the song I was listening to yesterday, I, I mean, that would have been great for it. You know, that, that, that would have been a great song to do. You know, Lo Love is All That I Ever Needed, right? That's a great song to cover, but um, we'll see. Because again, uh, my my buddy has um, has done Johnny Holiday and Weeds have put together a really good version of I Woke Up in Love this morning. How familiar yeah. are you with David's solo work? I, I definitely had the album cover Cherish as one of my sort of go to study, try and copy the hairstyle type of um, <laughs> of albums, you know. He had kind of a little bit like my hair. Maybe it was a little bit, uh, he was either easier to feather, but he was the first guy that said, hey, maybe I, if I get the feathered look and I just, you know, use the comb from in my, instead of in my back pocket, I use it on my head. Yeah, that'll work. How do you define success? Um, being able to do what you want to do on a monthly, yearly, decade basis. Um, enjoying what you do and not having to um, worry about what you're going to order on the menu when you go out to eat. <laughs> Does that sound okay? I mean, <laughs> I mean, and if you could do that, if you, if you could always go out to eat, if you wanted to and not worry about, okay, maybe I shouldn't order that today, you know, and it's just been recently, and it's and it's more of a state of mind, I believe, than it is actual financial freedom, because I think you can always order whatever you want. It's just a lot of times as musicians, we have this feeling of scarcity instead of abundance. Mm -hmm. And when we live under this, and not just musicians, probably a lot of people do, if we can shift that just a little bit, something as small as ordering exactly what the hell you want to order on, on a menu or, you know, not think about if you like that shirt, not think about, Oh, well, maybe I can get it for cheaper at the, when it goes on sale in six months when it's out of style, maybe I can do that. No, if you can just spend the extra $20, extra $50. Now you can get, if you can get your mind to do that, I think you're on the road to success because you're thinking, you're giving yourself, um, you're, saying, you're saying to yourself that you are worth it and you are successful, even if it doesn't, you know, equate to millions in the bank, it doesn't have to be millions in the bank. It's more of a state of mind. So that's why I say, you know, my, my definition of success might not have to do with the size of mansion or how many cars you own, because I've seen, really unhappy people that own fleets of cars. I've also seen very happy people that own, you know, helicopters and hell and, and helipads, which is great. And and I'm, I'm happy for people that have that success, that financial success, but it doesn't always equate to happiness being financially well off. Is that something that you tell your students through your system 12 guitar method? I wonder if you've got a moment to just explain the importance sure. and how you are now passing the torch to the next generation. <laughs> yeah, I, I put together, um, along with a really cool team of, of guys and gals, uh, you met Federico before the show, and, and we have a team together. We call it the RGA, the Roxy Guitar Army, RGA. And we put together, um, actually we're working on it, a little bit before the pandemic hit in 2020, but it was really good timing in that sense where we rushed it to put it out because we knew that at that time there was a lot of people at home climbing the walls, wanting to do something, wanting to learn something, and they had the time. So we put together a guitar course that I think is the most comprehensive, easy to learn, well-constructed um, way of 
showing you all the basics of guitar and how to get from you know, zero to playing 12 songs in a matter of 12 weeks. That's why it's called System 12. A lot of things revolve around the number 12. For instance, in music, you know, with notes, for instance, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, with their sharps and flats, everything in music, unless you get into all these weird semitones and bitones and um, Indian flavored type of music, in conventional Western music, there is 12 notes. That's it. So if you can memorize those 12 notes, if you can count from one to 12 and your ABCs, A until the letter G, I can teach you how to play guitar and I can teach you how to play songs and we can teach you um, how to have that attitude of enjoying the ride, enjoying the journey of learning the guitar because you will ha experience challenges, whether in your career or whether just taking on something new, but it doesn't have to be a negative. You will experience those challenges, but you will be very, very surprised when you start to overcome that and, and really joyous when you start playing songs that, you, that you've always wanted to learn with System 12. And we teach a song on the very first lesson. So, I mean, you can go on to my ryanroxy.com website and we have the first lesson up for free. You'll learn a song basically this afternoon if you pick it up and just start playing a guitar. All you have to do is know uh, an open string. So that's, that's and, and I teach the, we, you know, I teach the course a little bit unconventional because non-traditional, if you will. Because a lot of people, you know, that want to learn guitar, they put a guitar in their hands and then somebody, a teacher usually, or some sort of YouTube video tells you that you're supposed to take your left hand and obviously be your left hand, you switch it around, but you're supposed to take your left hand and move it in all these weird positions that you've never put your hand in before, before you learn guitar. You know, it's like, okay, you're, it's called your first position chords, your cowboy chords, if you will. Well, I don't teach cowboy chords until week seven or eight. It's way down the list because I want you to learn the notes on the neck going up and down. In fact, I concentrate on the sixth string and the fifth string first and get you to play bar chords. Once you know your bar chords, the names of them, where they are in the guitar neck, you can play any song ever written. That's Beatles, that's Led Zeppelin, Alice Cooper, especially David Cassidy. Wow. Because <laughs> you can learn schools out in just one afternoon, can't you? I could teach you that in one afternoon. I could teach it to you in an hour. Um, and I, and we do have that as one of the songs in one of the lessons that, that's in system 12. So it's one of those things, uh, if you're interested in learning it, learning an instrument, which I think everybody should do, it's, yeah. it's really good therapy. It's good way to spend your time and it's rewarding. It, it's just, it's just self reward that you get. It's, um, just go by, uh, ryanroxy.com or, or go on my Instagram which is just at Ryan Roxy and send me a DM because that's the thing. Everybody on the team on the RGA team is very uh, supportive of one another. And when you join the uh, system 12, you're automatically invited to our private Facebook group where it's a community where everybody sort of puts up videos and shows, Hey, this is what I learned this week. This is what helped me. Um, maybe this can help you. So again, a really cool sort of environment to be in wow what are your three favorite riffs um of my own or other people's or what do you think other people's other people's riffs um wow well you said schools out or poison any of those alice cooper songs where i get to start you know a lot of shows i get to start schools out i get to start poison and i immediately see every hand in the audience go up so that's a really cool thing to be able to do. You have this, you feel like you have this sense of power that you're channeling their musical, you know, where they first heard that song, their experience of when they, you can see it in their eyes. It's like, yes, I remember this wow. time when I first heard this or this time that I heard it and it impacted my life. So those are great riffs to play. Um, there's so many great guitar riffs out there. Um, the one that I love playing, you mentioned the move. 
um, I, it was California Man. And in the break, the version that, that I took California Man was from Cheap Trick. It's off the Heaven Tonight album. Of course, they had done a cover. So I actually did a recorded a cover of a cover. So the move, which became ELO, and then Cheap Trick covered California Man. And then I covered it on my solo album, uh, imagine your reality, that middle part, that little breakdown, down, 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 down. I just, something about it is such a great guitar riff. So not the obvious guitar riff that you would hear, that you would hear from a guitar player. Cause you know, obviously Led Zeppelin will take over a lot of amazing guitar riffs. Brian May from Queen has written a million of them. The guys from Aerosmith have. Rolling Stones have written riffs that go on and on for days. I mean, and Angus Young, you know, he just sort of wakes up every morning and probably writes a great riff. So I think, you know, early ACDC records, as far as like chord riffs, those are always my favorite. Because if you think about it, early ACDC wrote, you know, all the same, all the same chords they use. They use the same basic three or four chords, but they were able to manipulate them and twist them and turn them in such a way that it always was a catchy riff. Then, of course, there's then we get into the pop vein, and of course, you know, uh, I, uh, what is it? I think I love you is a great one to to, to has a, has a cool riff in it as well. One of my favorite riffs that's not so much a guitar riff but more of a piano riff is SOS by ABBA. I think that's one of the most well-constructed songs out there. So, you know, yeah. If you want riffs, I got, I, I always hearing new riffs every single day. We spoke about success earlier on, but you have said that um, success for you is summed up in the three P's, practice, persistence, and patience. That's true. Yeah. I've, I've actually added now, because oh. now I've made it P's and D's. So like your per diems, the per diems of life, if you will, is your P's and D's. And it's practice, persistence, and patience. Now I go into the three P's a lot when I, on my TED Talk. So if you're interested in me going to them in detail, you can go check out my uh, official YouTube channel where I have the TED Talk that I was able to do um, just a while back. So yeah, practice, persistence, and patience. But then I've added these D's, the three D's as well. And that is desi desire, discipline, and determination. Sort of similar, but three other nice, helpful words where if you think about it, you know, you have to have the desire. You have to set goals for yourself. You need to desire things or at least, you know, turn them into goals. Not wishing, desiring because you want to attain them. And then you have to have that discipline, which is just like, you know, practice and uh, encompasses all those three P's and then uh, determination, which is basically everything in life is determination. Do you have to pinch yourself sometimes and think, wow, this is my life now. How lucky am I? The boy who wanted to be the rock star guitarists who you had <laughs> plastered on your bedroom walls. Suddenly um, you're an inspiration to other people, do you feel a responsibility to that? I feel very happy that I'm able to inspire other people that might want to carry on and carry the tra tradition. That's why I always say about passing the torch of rock on to the next generation. And it was, I was happy that you said, you know, that's what I'm doing with System 12 um, is passing my knowledge on to the next generation. Um, it's not that I pinch myself and it's not that... I ne there never goes a day where I'm not thankful and I, and I think about it, but I'm also, um, I wouldn't say I, I ever expected it, but I do believe that if you are determined to do something, it will eventually happen. It will eventually happen. The hardest thing for most of us, and I have this problem as well, is when you set goals for yourself, sometimes you don't complete it 
because you didn't have that patience. You didn't have the patience because it will happen. If you set it out there, it will, but the work does have to go into it. So there's been things where, you know, I have started and haven't finished and that's okay. Wasn't the right window or door for me at that time. Right now I have a set of goals of what I'm doing um, that I want to continue to achieve. So I don't ever want to just rest on the past things that I've in past goals and past achievements that I've been able to attain. I'm happy about it. I'm thankful for it, but I don't want to always rely on it. I want to look forward to like what's next for me that I would want to accomplish and that would make me happy um, to see done. So I'm, I'm still, it's, it's always a work in progress, but I'm doing my best. And like I said, we, with the RGA, we try to do it together. We try to do it in a supportive way and we try to do it with as much, um, with as much help one another as possible. Before we tie up this afternoon, sure. do you ever worry about hearing loss as a rock musician? Because <laughs> I know Dave Grohl and Brian Johnson have spoken about the hearing loss they have suffered. I wonder if it's yep. something that you look to the future and say, well, how long will I <sighs> wow. if I lose my hearing? It, it, it's definitely one of the, we were talking about fame earlier, one of the things that goes along with the job. And, and yeah. that is health-wise probably one of the biggest things. But there's a lot of people that have jobs that require really loud noises and you know you're you're subject to loud things i'm happy that i'm able to do what i've always loved to do and always wanted to do with this i am conscious of it i think i grew up in the touring mode where yeah, i definitely have suffered hearing damage you know club tours early alice tours where before everything was in-ear monitors rehearsal rooms with the drummer crash riding his cymbals because the cymbals at ear level those get you um more than anything else people don't really talk about the cymbals so much i mean dave Grohl talks about it being there's certain frequencies that he doesn't hear at all but there's other frequencies that he knows and hears that other people can't hear or maybe not hear as well like i can hear it around the house i have uh, my wife will call me sometimes and i'll, I'll say what what did you say and she'll have to say something you know twice, sometimes three, if it gets to four times, then, she's, then, then it's a problem. But you know, twice I'll say what? And she'll tell me again. But then for instance, just the other day, there was a, in the living room, there was a, a sound, a really like a high pitched type of sound. It was because we have an led light bulb in a regular, a light socket because we, one of our lights went out. So she couldn't hear it but it was driving me crazy and, and and i was like do you not hear that sound do you not hear that that and she's like i can't hear it at all so i'd have to unscrew the light bulb um and then she didn't hear any difference of it and and finally i went to the uh, hardware store yesterday and picked up a couple old school 40 watt bulbs and now we're <laughs> we're sorted out again <laughs> So you're uh, at home at the moment, but you're going to be joining Alice on the second part of his tour and coming to London. And you're We are. Well, we're, first we're going back to the States and Canada. That ha kicks off in a few weeks. Um, we'll be touring with some really cool bands, some really cool uh, Buck Cherry, and I think Ace Freely is on some of the gigs as well, as, as well as some Alice Cooper solo stuff. So... Yeah. Again, anybody wants to find out about the touring schedule, that's all at ryanroxy.com. It's got everything there. It's got the tour dates. Again, if you're interested in learning guitar, it's got the guitar lessons as well as everything else. The podcast um, that I do weekly as well is up there as well. So, yeah, that happens in the next few weeks. And then um, later on in uh, June, July, we are May, June and July. We are doing the UK all across Europe and hopefully keep adding dates. That's going to be fabulous. Well, I think today yeah. we've been in the right place at the right time, as <laughs> you have been so many occasions in, in the past in, in your life. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was nice to talk about uh, some pop. It's nice to talk about my stuff and what I've brought to the table as far as mixing thrashy guitar rock and still having these uh, very bubblegum pop roots 
growing up. And um, yeah, in the spirit of David Cassidy, I mean, hopefully we can continue to um, create really good music and put it out there and keep on touring. Keep on rocking. Doing my best. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Louise. Thank I appreciate it. It's been wonderful. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we'll talk soon. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, Louise.